Good evening, and welcome once again to Vulture's Rainbow Theatre. I am your distinguished host, Damon Vulture. Tonight we will be listening to chapters 7, 8, and 9 of The Guns of Sotol Flats. The listener is warned, advised to remember that this is a work of dark fiction, in which will appear acts of graphic violence and supernatural phenomena deemed by most to be diabolical. And now, we begin with Chapter 7, Fort Dickerson. Colonel Billington, now promoted to general, and his adjutant, Major Fernando Carlson, rode through the rising and falling brush country, seeing their destination ahead as they came to the tops of rolling waves of rocky land, and then losing sight of the fortification as they plunged down into arroyos filled with mesquite and juniper. As they rode in the direction of Fort Dickerson, which was just ahead, Billington glanced again at his black shoulder bars, each embroidered with two gold stars and gold borders. Now this was more like it, he thought to himself. He brought his party to a halt at the top of a long, low bluff down from which the land descended until it reached the fort below. From that height, he could see what was happening inside the stone walls of the old Tulixcan Presidio these troops were occupying as a fort. The watch had already spotted him far off. The bugler had sounded his imminent arrival, which brought men scurrying out of their barracks, buttoning up jackets and assembling in order on the dusty parade ground within the enclosure of the fort. He could see the fort's commander, Captain Spain, stepping from out of the shadows of his front porch, pulling on gloves and adjusting his sword. The captain received his sergeant's salute and then stood at attention with the troops. Now this Captain Spain, thought the general, there is a man who knows how to run his command, by God. The well-disciplined assembly of the fort's garrison stood stiffly at attention as the general and his party rode through the open gates of the Presidio, and Billington was gratified to see them present arms in crisp unison as he brought his entourage to a stop within the walls. "'You received my telegram, of course,' the general asked, dismounting as Carlson held the reins of his horse. "'Yes, General,' Spain replied. If you don't mind me saying, sir, it's about time the government gave us a free hand out here. Agreed, Billington said, clapping Fort Dickerson's commander on the shoulder. I could use a drink. Certainly, sir, the captain said. My office is just over there. As they walked away, Carlson gave orders to the small staff which General Billington had brought with them. The sergeant shouted, Dismissed to the assembled troops. By the time the two men were in the door of the captain's headquarters, the formal assembly had dissolved, leaving the parade ground empty. As Captain Spain poured two shot glasses half full with whiskey, Billington made small talk with his subordinate. "'It's been too long. I've forgotten what men do for entertainment out here,' he asked, looking through the window at the empty parade ground, where the late morning sun beat down on tussocks of dry grass and fist-sized rocks. "'Search me,' replied the captain. "'Fact is, sir, the men are bored and need something to do. I believe your orders came as welcome relief to all of them.' They're certainly excited about the prospect of coming to grips with El Calvo and his bandits. How about the second part of those orders, asked the general. What do they think about the expedition into the Squotilleria? Less enthusiastic, I fear, sir, Spain answered. They'd like to deal some vengeance in that quarter, no doubt, but Chief Santiago has a reputation. 
Frankly, General Sir, I think they're a little scared of fighting the Squotills. As they should be, Billington replied. My predecessor died in the last campaign up there. He paused to consider that item of recent history for a moment. Which brings me to some particulars we need to discuss. Captain Spain, as I'm sure you're aware, even when all of our troops rendezvous at Villarreal del Rio, we're not going to have enough men to take on two enemies at once. My plan right now is to deal with El Calvo first. If we can keep a low profile well north of town until his next raid, we may be able to catch him by surprise. Before we go anywhere near Santiago, our Talixcan senator needs to be put out of business permanently. I assume, sir, that you already have plans drawn up for this action, said the captain. There with my adjutant, Major Carlson, answered the general, finishing his drink and holding up the glass for a second. As Captain Spain poured, he continued, As I'll explain later, when Lieutenants Reno and Waycross get here from Puente de Piedra, I intend to place scouts along the river where they can observe from concealed positions and the tall growth there. Meanwhile, we'll send some of our best scouts into Villarreal, out of uniform, of course. One will keep an eye on the Sierra Negra Pass from an upstairs room of the Dolphus Hotel, which faces south toward Tolixco. That observer will switch off with two others who, when not otherwise occupied, will be collecting intelligence about El Calvo's doings through whatever rumors, gossip, or straight information they can acquire, while appearing to be civilians about the business of buying land along the river. All three of these picked men speak Tolixcan fluently, so that should prove useful. We'll discuss exact positions where the troops themselves will be posted at the meeting. I'll need your expertise and advice as well as those of your subordinates. If we do catch El Calvo and his men by surprise, asked the captain, what is our intention? To kill them all, said Billington. That will be our message to President Gallegos and any other Talixcan who wants to raid across our borders. Stay out or else. Chapter 8 Kildare It was his bar, damn it! His very own place for which he had worked hard saving up money from working as a laborer for years on the Western Alhambra Railroad line. With his safe, Simon Dulhunty had acquired a prime plot of land just off the main boulevard, near the courthouse, the territorial legislature, and the opera. He'd built the place with his own hands and the help of a crew of Talixkins, including some artisans from below the border living under its unfinished roof until the place was ready. His clientele, until a couple of months ago, had been men with money and position. His Golden Horn Saloon, named after a more famous establishment back east with the same moniker, had been a favorite retreat for local congressmen, army officers, speculators and businessmen, even those who came on the train from beyond the territory. With the money that rolled in, he'd acquired a sterling chef and had added a stage for entertainment. With the opera house nearby, there was no want of talent to provide for the somewhat risque, continental-style performances his male audiences relished. But that clientele had changed, beginning with the arrival of the masked men. That had occurred one night about two months ago when, just a half hour before the place would have closed, three individuals came into the Golden Horn, not bothering to remove their hats. Two of the gentlemen wore suits which bespoke the usual level of wealth one came to expect from guests of the establishment, but the third, 
in the travel-stained weeds of a common cowpoke, clearly did not belong in the saloon, nor, for that matter, with the companions he had chosen. But even stranger than the association of this calf-roper with gentlemen of a superior class was the fact that all three men entered the bar with their heads and faces completely covered under masks of heavy, dark cloth, in which appeared neither eye-holes nor openings for mouths. While one would have expected them to be blinded by such bizarre affectations as these, they walked past tables and chairs to the bar without any hesitation, as if they could actually see the obstacles placed before them. The phenomenon was noted by all and sundry in the room as men dropped their cards and conversations to regard the dark trio in total silence. "'Will it be, gentlemen?' Simon had asked, ever the polite proprietor. He affected not to notice their remarkable oddity, keeping his tone matter-of-fact. "'Beers for all of us,' one man replied, his voice muffled by the black fabric which covered his head and neck. By the time Simon returned from the tap, conversation had resumed in the place, and the three men, who thanked him for their drinks, appeared to be pulling cigars from their breast pockets. The cigars were strangely dark, black, in fact, and the men did not light them as one would expect. Instead, they lifted the cloths away from their mouths and ate these objects as if they were pieces of pulled taffy or licorice. The men lifted the bottom parts of their masks again and swallows of ale followed, after which the men sat at the bar silent and motionless, seemingly unaware of the furtive looks they were receiving from the customers. The following weeks had brought more of such men, Though on each occasion they waited until late in the evening to arrive, these men and their growing numbers began to crowd out the usual customers who were put off by their covered faces and universal consumption of what appeared to be a narcotic. Even the anticipation of their arrival caused Dulhunty's regulars to steer clear of his place until nearly every familiar face had been replaced by men with no faces at all. He was working his tremulous way through another evening in which the bar had stayed nearly empty until 10.30, at which time the strange new crowd had begun, as usual, to arrive one at a time or in small groups. There were enough of them now to occupy most of the tables and much of the bar. They didn't talk much, except to order drinks. But just a few minutes ago, one of the men, a prominent figure among them by the prosperous look of his clothing, had come to the bar to tell him, Mr. Dullhunty, we understand that this is your establishment, and I feel awkward in asking this favor of you, but on behalf of everyone here, I'm... I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind stepping outside for about 30 minutes. I'm not leaving my bar, Dulhunty had said. That's fine, Mr. Dulhunty, the masked man had replied. I thought you might object to such a request. Since that's the case, I will insist that you step into your office back there and shut the door. I'll have a man watching. He's a lowlife with a quick trigger, so I would suggest that you stay put. Don't even crack that portal. Am I understood, Mr. Dullhunty? Simon had nodded silently, a numbing fear replacing the outrage he'd been feeling up to that moment. He couldn't even feel his feet as he marched back to his office and shut its door. Now here he was, sitting behind his desk, a prisoner, for the moment, in his own establishment. What was the world coming to? He wasn't sure he wanted to know the answer to that question.
Chapter 9 in the Huesos Mountains Eduardo González had resigned himself to Billy's silence, which had remained unbroken since they left Villarreal and headed north. They had gone to Villarreal de Rio in the first place for a reason, to follow the first part of Don José's advice. The Rural had warned them of the darkness that was coming from over the western desert, had advised them to gather as many allies as they could from wherever they could, for the threat that now loomed over the western ocean was moving inexorably toward their own land. The first of those to whom Don José had directed them was El Calvo, the Tulixcan military leader, who had over 200 men at his command, armed and trained for combat. But the raid on the Winter's ranch had hardened Billy to any further efforts in that direction. Eduardo knew beyond a shadow of doubt why Billy was now heading to the Huesos Mountains. Within that circle of peaks, high up under the old volcano cone which men called La Calavera, they would find Eduardo's mentor, the witch Doña Zopilota, of whom men whispered that she was La Marida de Tinieblas, the Bride of Darkness. It was from her that Eduardo had received the gift of unerring aim for a price. Billy wanted that gift too, if he could convince her to bestow it. With his darling Sequoia, the victim of rape and murder, the only thing in his mind for which he now had room was vengeance. Still, thought Eduardo, Doña Zopilota's gift of perfect aim with a firearm was a good one, and maybe Billy could be brought back to common sense and a return to their original plan once he'd had time to grieve and cool down. They'd been headed toward the Huesos range for a couple of days now, observing, as they rode slowly over the desert, the changing moods of those mountains as they lit up orange in the morning sun under clear skies, as they turned black in the afternoons, their tops obscured in gray clouds from which lightning issued at intervals, as if warning off those who approached. Now they were leaving the desert floor, riding upward on a narrow trail which ran through a thicket of short-leaf pine, part of the forest which covered the slopes of the circular Huesos range, giving way up higher to bare rocky bluffs near its summits, and thinning out into dry desert down in the bowl of its circular valley. This was their third morning out from Villarreal del Rio, and the sky was clear and blue except where white mist roiled around the cliff face of La Calavera's bare, stony mountain top, that summit looming above them as they traversed the mountain's lower slopes, that summit casting its shadow all the way through the forest in which they rode, down to the valley floor. In silence they rode through the dense pines on the steeply climbing dirt trail, past fallen rhyolite boulders the size of houses, over fallen tree trunks and through muddy pools where water still stood on the path from yesterday's rain. By early afternoon they'd arrived in an open meadow just under the great cliff face which thrust up out of La Calavera, forming its summit. The mouths of two great caves, nearly even in height, high above them, gave the impression of eye sockets in the face of a massive stone skull. At the end of the meadow, which came right to the foot of this rock formation, heaps of fallen stone around the bases of eroded, upthrust columns of rhyolite gave the impression of rotted, disordered teeth. Hence the mountain's name, Calavera, or Skull. As the sun fell toward the western end of the bowl-shaped valley, ready at any moment to sink behind the bare peaks of the lower Huesos range, the two men began to notice vultures circling overhead in massive numbers. The great kettle of carrion birds, wheeling and whirling around on an invisible chimney of air, flew silently, their wings outspread and nearly motionless, but for the occasional twitch 
of single feathers as they sought to keep their balance on the wind in the deepening blue of the sky. Eduardo was leading Billy along the foot of the skull toward its southern flank, where the columns of stone gave way to a thicket of scrub oak under which, at that late hour, shadows brooded. The thicket seemed somehow to be the center of the vulture's wheeling motion. It was also the terminus of the trail, that ribbon of red dirt disappearing into a dark gap between branches. As they drew near, Billy and Eduardo could smell the burning smell that always came from in there, and in fact, tendrils of gray smoke rose up through the glossy canopy of oak leaves to dissipate in the deep sky of late afternoon. The bride of darkness was always brewing something back in there, probably best for most people not to know what it was. Once they rode under the shade of those gnarled limbs, Eduardo thought that Billy might turn his horse around. He did come to a stop for just a moment, looking up at twisted branches from which hung the numberless carcasses of dead things. Nearby, a rotting deer hung head to earth, rotating by its hind feet bound to a tree branch with strips of leather, the points of its rack scraping arcs into the mud below it. A flock of perhaps twenty crows hung upside down with their claws tied together, their wings outspread and beaks down, swayed slightly in the afternoon breeze which caused the branches to move. There was a mountain lion, mostly skeleton now, bits of stiff dried fur and brittle hair clinging to its dry bones. Rats hung there, and mice, and sparrows in their hundreds, some recently dead, some in an advanced state of decay, some reduced to bits of bone, the odd ribs and femurs and tiny skulls still clinging together by bits of dried gray sinew. There was a stench to the place, the kind that clings to a man's skin and clothes long after he has left its source behind. They rode on under the oaks through this charnel wood of slain offerings, their way lighted by the occasional reddish beam of light which the late sun sent through woven trees. Billy and Eduardo began to catch glimpses, now and again, of a cave entrance, a black, roughly rectangular opening in the lower cliff face of La Calavera, there at the far end of the oak thicket in which they rode. As the sun's light, fallen behind the lower peaks of the Huesos, began to fail, they could make out, through the tangle of limbs, leaves, and hanging liches, the glow of firelight on stone just outside that dark cave entrance. Billy heard the cracking of branches off to his right in the shadows of the wood, and when he looked that way for just a second, he thought he saw a huge black wolf looking at him with strange red-hued eyes glowing in the near dark. The thing turned slowly just then and padded back through underbrush in the direction of the cliff with its cave and firelight. At last they arrived at the foot of La Calavera stone summit, finding themselves in a clearing where they could see the sky again, now purple with twilight, the last faint glimmer of the departed sun revealing to them the looming westward flank of La Calavera. Above them, high up in the monstrous stone face of that summit, they could see the right eye of the skull, the great cave like a skull's dark orbit, gazing westward toward the last bloody remnants of the day's light. In the clearing itself, a fire blazed near the entrance of the hidden lower cave toward which they'd been riding, the fire licking the bottom of a great iron cauldron hanging on an iron rod between two stone posts flanking the fire pit. 
Something bubbled within the stew pot, its dark aroma wafting upward on billows of steam and wood smoke. As they dismounted to tie up their horses, the great black wolf they had seen moments before now entered the clearing where it dissolved gently into a column of black mist, out of which, seconds later, a woman emerged, a rail-thin beauty whose blood-crimson eyes seemed, in some alarming fashion, to glow as if reflecting the firelight. Her hair, long and black, fell down her shoulders to her waist, framing a regal Tolixkan face with strong cheekbones and chin, out of which those disquieting eyes gazed, transfixing Billy. She was clad in rough black robes from which, at the sleeves, tatters and threads hung, partially obscuring long, pale hands, the fingers of which were stained with the lifeblood of her most recent animal sacrifices. In her left hand, where the gore-stained fingers were intertwined and twisted with the loose threads of her sleeve, she held a long black staff from the top of which emerged a hoop. Some tarry substance, black and sticky, had been laboriously stretched across that hoop in the rudimentary pattern of a spider's web on which the white figure of a tarantula carved from animal bone had been fixed. Across the front of her robe, crudely painted in white lime, was the image of a great spider over which hung the horned, faceless head and expansive, arching wings of some kind of demon. You, I know, she said, fixing her disquieting gaze on Eduardo. Then, slowly, she turned those eyes on Billy. Who the hell are you? The name's Ryder, ma'am, he said. William Ryder. Folks call me Billy, he added, looking away when the woman's eyes began, began to cause his own to burn. You better have a good reason for being here, she said. Because if you don't, you're dead. Billy looked at Eduardo for some help. After all, El Tiburón had what he assumed was a friendly relationship with her. Eduardo said nothing. The witch looked at Ryder expectantly. Billy realized the shuttlecock was in his court. I came here because I want what Eduardo's got, he said. I want the killer's unerring eye. She considered him for a moment, her lips betraying a faint twitch of contemptuous amusement for the unshaven supplicant. You want the killer's unerring eye, she echoed back to him, the slightest hint of mockery in her low, subdued voice. What for, she asked, for fame, for fortune? She looked him over again in silence. No, she then said, answering her own question. You want revenge, Nieto. Isn't that right? La venganza. Billy did not reply. If she knew the answer, she knew the answer. People pay for my gifts, William Ryder, she said then. Ask your friend. Yes, ma'am. I know what the price is, he replied. No, you don't, Doña Zopiletta said back. You don't know what the price is, but you will find out. She waited as if she were expecting Billy to say something like, Okay, let's hear it. Billy just looked back at her. He let his eyes burn this time. He had no intention of looking away again. The 
one I serve is hungry, she said finally. Hungry like you would not believe. But she does not just eat flesh, will you ride her? She devours everything. Everything including time and space. A poet from another dimension has said that though lovers may die, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. Not so, Nieto. Even love will someday be gone, passing blindly down her gullet along with everything else. She actually smiled at that thought. But that is all in the future, William Ryder, she said. The universe is a meal of many courses, each to be savored. At this meal, she likes especially to taste eternity on her tongue. That is where you and others like you come in. There is a part of you which carries this taste of the eternal, your very own precious soul. What do you think about that, William Ryder? she asked. The goddess I serve loves her devotees. If they are served to her properly. She laughed, a long mocking laugh which made the bounty hunter quail for a moment. He came close to spurring his horse out of that clearing, but stood his ground. she said, beckoning them with her free hand as she turned toward the cave entrance. The two men followed, passing into total darkness. I will take your arm, amigo, said El Tiburon, for you will not be able to see where we are going. Billy could feel the floor of the cave descending beneath his feet, and later, by the many turns which seemed almost circular, he knew that the cave spiraled downward like a corkscrew or a winding stair. He himself was completely blind, but he knew why Eduardo was not. The price Eduardo had paid to become a gunslinger of matchless aim had been high, but it had come with benefits. Seeing in the dark was one of them. They wound on down through the endless rock. At last, it seemed as though the floor of the cave leveled out, and Billy, when released from Eduardo's hold, discovered that even his outstretched arms could no longer touch uneven walls. Apparently, they were in some kind of grotto. A strange blue light began to assert itself amid the deep shadows of the chamber, emanating from a crystal sphere mounted between the upthrust tines of a trio of stalagmites, serving as a tripod for the luminous object. In the glow, all Ryder could see of Doña Zopilota was her face and hands, the light of her eyes now taking on a violet hue. She appeared to be elevated, as if she stood on a shelf of stone in the cavern which served as a kind of dais. It was impossible to tell for sure in the shadows. El Tiburon stood next to her. For a moment it seemed to Billy that the two of them were some kind of divine couple of the underworld, a goddess and her consort gazing down at their lone suppliant. Both of them reached their hands then up to their eyes, digging their fingers deep under the lids. With a wet, liquid sound, they pried out their own eyeballs, holding them between the thumb and forefinger of each hand. Now they stood with empty, gaping sockets, circles of darkness looking out through the dim, bluish light upon darkness. The witch began to chant something which sounded to Billy like, I... Not. I... Ma'af. 
rogamos presentiam divinam suam in oxitu santu. The words echoed from the walls of the cavern like liturgy chanted by a monk in the main sanctuary of a cathedral. Eduardo took up the chant with her. It had been one thing to hear from Eduardo years ago that the price of unerring aim had been his eyes, and he knew that the eyes had been only part of the price. Now to see Eduardo before him, eyeless, holding out in his hands two glass orbs artfully made by God only knew what demon artisan, which served to convince others that he still possessed those organs of sight. That was something else again. Standing there beside his macabre and forsworn mentor, empty sockets gazing sightlessly out into the dark along with her, Eduardo now appeared as he really was, a soul completely and entirely given over to something from which he could never turn loose. If the witch was the bride of darkness, he was just as surely its husband, and the union they shared in their menage a trois with endless night was eternal. This was the real price for the gun that never missed. Eduardo's eyes, plus an eternity to be spent in the dark. And yet, Billy felt that same dark pulling at him with the blandishments of a lover. He could no more repent of his intentions than he could stop breathing. William Ryder, intoned the witch, gazing upon him with empty eye sockets, as if she herself were the face of eternal darkness. In exchange for the gift which you have sought, do you now and forever renounce your eyes, your body and soul to Yat, the mother of night and the eater of worlds? All things proceed from her, and to her they must return. Do you now, and forever, renounce them? Billy thought of Sequoia, taken, violated, and killed, just like the despoiled virgin of the cards. He thought of the men who had done this thing, and what he wanted to do to them. He savored the future satisfaction of that vengeance as if it were an accomplished fact, smelled it in the air as if it were a dish already set sizzling upon a wood-burning stove. I renounce them, now and forever, he said. There came a sound from behind him, as if something large, larger maybe even than an elephant, were walking slowly toward him on multiple legs. He could hear the brushing of an enormous body against stone, the clack and scrape of chitinous feet on the stony cavern floor. Something huge, which he could not see, now loomed over him from behind. It moaned with hunger. He turned to see it and screamed, just as two proboscis buried themselves in the orbits of his skull. Something was wrenching his eyeballs from out of his head as they tore away, twisting on stretched strings of rippling muscle and nerve tissue, spilling blood down on his cheeks. He screamed again and again until consciousness left him.
You have been listening to Vulture's Rainbow Theatre. Remember, as always, that we are sponsored by Vulture's Rainbow, your mobile home of dark art. This weekend, September 11th, our little shop of terrors will be set up in Trader's Village on Highway 290. We'll be open all day, and we look forward to your visit. This is Damon Vulture, wishing you a good night and dark dreams.